So good morning. I'd like to welcome you all to our presentation on the government and crowns with respect to the changes that will be happening with our uh, new rate model. I'm also uh, sending out a welcome to the people who are attending online through webinar. So it's my pleasure to share with you today information on WCB's enhanced rate model. Today, we will be reviewing the impact of the rate model changes by looking at what would have happened had we implemented those changes in 2017 as compared to the 2017 rates under the old model that were approved by the board. This comparison of the 2017 old, if you like, to the new enhanced model will give you a sense of the magnitude of the change to your rates for 2018 when we implement the new model. We are not giving you your 2018 rates today as the data to complete the 2018 rates is not yet complete. So this presentation will take about an hour, maybe a little over an hour. And uh, after the pre presentation, we will uh, entertain questions from both uh, the people attending in person as well as those attending via webinar. So the things we want to cover today is a little bit about uh, why WCB exists, why we did the rate model review, and most importantly, the impact of the changes on the various industry codes when we compare the current to the enhanced model uh, using 2017 data. At the end of the presentation, we'll go over a few next steps uh, with respect to the model implementation. So we've previously shared some of this information at regional educational meetings that we had in November and December, where we explained at a high level the changes that would be coming with the rate model. So these presentations and webinars are available online, as well as a full report from the consultants who did the review of our rate model. So if you'd like uh, to brush up or, or you have uh, some questions about some of this information, you may find it in those on our website. So why do we pay WCB premiums? Before 1915, or in the early 1900s, if a worker was injured at work, his only recourse was to sue his employer. If he did attempt to sue his employer, he was more than likely not successful. However, if he, the court did order a restitution, it could be a huge financial burden for his employer often resulting in bankruptcy of that employer. Either way, the injured worker would end up without benefits and become a burden to the state and reliant upon social security programs. This resulted in increased costs for government. It also impacted the economic, um, the economy at, at several levels. At the injured worker level, he had no means to support himself or his family. The employer could be facing bankruptcy if they had to uh, provide funds for an injured worker that were, accept like, were large. And there was also an impact with respect to society for the costs of supporting injured workers who had no way of supporting themselves. So in Canada, specifically in Ontario, in the early 1900s, government recognized the problem of the increased social benefit costs. And they were looking across to what was happening in Europe, so specifically Germany, where a workers' compensation system had already been in place. So the Ontario government commissioned a study. Sir William Meredith crafted a workers' compensation model that he called the historic compromise. So this compromise meant that workers would give up their right to sue in exchange for security of benefits. So that meant that they would give up their right to sue in exchange for having compensation and medical benefits provided to them should they not be able to, to be at work because of a workplace injury. The other part of the compromise is that employers assumed the cost of the system 
in exchange for protection from legal action. So all jurisdictions across Canada and even across the world have adopted the model and have their own workers' compensation legislation. It's evolved over the years, but it's basically um, based on the same principles that Meredith outlined. Saskatchewan legislation with respect to WCB was enacted in 1929. So Meredith outlined principles when he came up with the historic compromise. The cornerstone or linchpin of the Meredith principles are is that it is a no-fault system, which means that workers are paid benefits regardless of how injuries occurred, and there's no argument over responsibility or liability for the injury. Both workers and employers waived their right to sue. Another linchpin or, or cornerstone of the Meredith principles is security of benefits, which means that a fund needs to be established to guarantee that the benefits for an injured worker could be paid currently in the current year as well into the future should that injury cause costs in future years. In Saskatchewan, our legislation requires that we be 100% funded to ensure that security of benefits for injured workers. The other cornerstone principle is that of collective liability, which means that employers on the whole share liability for workplace injury insurance. The total cost of the system is shared by all employers and all employers contribute to a common fund. This is similar to other insurance programs that all have an element of collective liability. If you think of your car or house insurance, you pay a premium to insure your property, but you know, or quite likely that premium you pay, you're not collecting on that in a year. However, you pay into it should you have to make a claim. So, Co collective liability ensures that no one employer sh bears the brunt of an unusually burdensome claim or a costly claim. The other principles that Meredith outlined had to do with how the system should run. So this principle, one of these principles was independent administration, which means that organizations who administer workers' compensation insurance should be separate from government to avoid political interference, either in setting rates or determining an entitlement to benefits under the system. And that workers' compensation boards should have exclusive jurisdictions, which means that only workers' compensation organizations should provide workers' compensation insurance, and all claims should be directed solely to the compensation board. The board is the decision maker and final authority for all claims. This principle supports the concept of collective liability, security of benefits, and provides for a robust system. These principles continue to be valid and support the workers' compensation systems today here in Canada and across the world. Oops, looks like I skipped ahead. So, the process to determine an employer's rate basically follows three steps. The main objective of the rate setting process is to ensure that we collect enough premiums for the costs related to today's injuries. Those injuries could have costs going out 50 years. So the first step when we begin the rate setting process is that industries are classified. So they're put into risk pools according to their business undertaking. In Saskatchewan, we have about 47,000 employers and they are assigned to 50 rate codes based on their business activity. So this becomes the risk pool that they are grouped with for determining the cost that will determine their premium going ahead. The second step is we analyze the costs for that risk pool or that rate code and determine what the premium for the coming year should be. And that premium 
needs to cover the costs, all costs related to the injuries to occur in the coming year. And we have a analytic process that goes through how we determine what those costs will be in the future, and I'll be reviewing that in later slides. So all employers in the rate code share in the costs of the risk pool or the rate code that they are assigned to. The last step of our rate setting process is what's um, called the experience rating program. And that looks at an employer's own experience and provides accountability for the injuries and the costs incurring at that employer's work location or within that organization. So the experience rating program considers individual employer experience and depending on that experience, employers can be assessed a surcharge or receive a discount on the base premium rate from step two. Within the experience rate program, there are two sub-programs. The first is the standard program, which is for employers with fewer than $21,000 of premiums over a three-year period. So these are our small employers. In this program, the experience rating program looks at the frequency of time loss injuries for that business to determine whether the employer would be eligible for a maximum discount of 25% and depending on the number of injuries, they could have a maximum surcharge of 75%. Approximately 88% of Saskatchewan employers fall into the standard program. The advanced program is for larger employers with premiums in excess of $21,000 over a three year period. This program is cost-based, and it basically works by comparing an individual employer's experience to the experience of other employers in his rate code to assess whether a penalty, be, penalty will be applied if they are worse than the average or if they will receive a discount if they're better than the average. So the maximum discount available in the advanced program is 30% and the maximum surcharge is 200%. So we start off at the board level. We have all of the employers. They're assigned to a classification or a risk pool. We calculate their rate and then we look at their own experience through the experience rating program to calculate the net premium rate. So why did we do the rate model review. The rate model review came about as a consequence of a review of our financial systems that began a couple of years ago. The first step was a review of our investment portfolio, the investments that we hold to earn investment income. When we set premium rates, we need to collect enough money to ensure that funds are available to pay the cost of injuries today and into the future. So for today's injuries, they could have costs going out 50 years. We have to ensure that we have security of benefit or enough funds to ensure that we can pay those costs into the future and that the cost of those injuries are assigned to today's employer. When we determine a rate, we assume that we can earn an expected rate of return. So when we did our asset study, we basically looked at our investment holdings and reviewed whether what was in our investment portfolio would earn that rate of return. The other objective of that study was to also assess the volatility of the rates of return that we have um, in our asset pool and suggest ways that we could perhaps change some of our investing holdings to still earn that same rate of return but reduce the volatility or the swings in the investment income. Following that review of our investment holdings, we conducted an asset liability study through an external actuary. This study reviewed or matched up the revenue stream coming from our investments to the stream of money going out on our benefit liability or the costs that we have, the runoff of our cost experience into the future, and look to see that they were related or 
um, concurrent. The AL study also reviewed our rate setting process because that's our other revenue generating activity. The rate, uh, the, the AL study, the asset liability study did a high level review of our rate model and suggested that we really need to do a more in-depth review and that is uh, what occurred in 2016. The other reason we did the rate model review is that we had heard from employers and employer groups that our rate model was not reactive enough to improvements or changes that were happening in injury rates. So the same um, consultant, Eckler, who did our asset liability study, also conducted the, re sorry, the review of our rate model. And when he did that review, he based it on balancing principles that basically come out of the Meredith principles that we reviewed earlier. These principles can sometimes compete or complement each other. And on the first set of scales, you see the scales to your uh, left, accountability versus collective liability. The accountability principle is based on the premise that current employers should be paying for the costs of current injuries, what it costs today and what that injury is going to cost into the future. It covers intergenerational equity so that current employers shouldn't be burdened with the costs of previous injuries or previous employers' injuries, and nor should they subsidize the costs of future employers' injuries. A fair rate making model encourages workplace safety and effective return to work by financially <coughs> incentivizing employers' behavior. So that's where the accountability comes in. Employers are held accountable for the cost of their injuries. Now, this can compete with the other side of the scales, which is collective liability. So with collective, collective liability, employers as a group are held responsible for compensation costs. With the collective liability side, just like your house insurance, you're assigned to a risk pool, you pay a premium. But if you have to make a claim, for example, if your house would burn down and you have a large, large claim, you don't bear the cost of that yourself. That cost is borne by the risk pool that you're assigned to. And it's a similar concept with workers' compensation. Expensive, large claims go into a pool that is collectively shared by all employers. We'll be exploring the concept of collective liability further on when we get into the actual recommendations from Eckler. On the other hand of the, so, um, of the page there, we want to have rates that are stable yet reactive. So we want to be reactive to improvements in injury rates, to reductions of costs, but we want to provide some stability so that rates can be predicted and predict predictable for employers. So the rate model needs to seek an appropriate balance of all of these principles in a transparent way. So what was critical to the review process? Predictability of costs, premiums, need to be collected in the future that will be su sufficient to cover the expected costs of today's injuries. So this is all about the security of benefits and we need to be able to predict how much revenue we need to collect to pay, they, to pay for today's costs, today's injuries, the costs of today's injuries. And the model needs to generate enough premiums to fund the system in a fair and equitable way. The other part of uh, the model is that it should be actuarially sound, which basically means it's a scientific approach based on actuarial professional standards that are used to predict what those future costs might be and assign the cost to the various risk pools or rate codes.
So Eckler, who was the external consultant, uh, conducted the review and came up with a couple of key findings as well as several recommendations. Eckler found that the current process for setting employer rate premiums is basically sound. At the board level, at the level of all 50 rate codes, we collect the required premiums. And that is reflected in the fact that when we calculate the board average premium rate under the new method as compared to uh, what we used in 2017, we, under both the old and the new, we came up with the same board average rate of $1.24. However, the actuary made several refinements to our model as he suggested several refinements to our model rather than a complete overhaul. He did say that in the shift to the enhanced model there would be some larger impacts in, at some industry rate codes because things have changed since we introduced our model in the 1990s, the current model that we're using. So what falls out of the key findings were several recommendations. We're going to go, be going through all of these in some detail in uh, future slides and showing you the impact of those recommendations on your particular rate code, except for the classification recommendation. I will speak to that one now. So Eckler recommended that the board establish a process to periodically review our classification system. Currently, we have 50 rate codes, and some of these rate codes are very small. They have a very few number of employers and re result in very few claims costs. The current process to review classification is kind of ad hoc. It's usually at the request of someone that we go and do that review. But Eckler said you really need to have a, a kind of a disciplined, systemic way to review classifications to ensure that rate codes are big enough to stand on their own, to have enough predictability in predicting future costs. The board um, appreciates this recommendation. However, to establish that kind of a process takes time. It takes lots of analysis. It also takes lots of consultation with the affected employer groups and stakeholders. So at this time, we are not um, going to act on this classification recommendation. However, we will be looking at setting up a process to ensure that we per periodically review our classification structure. So in the near and short term, we're going to be using one of the other um, recommendations and, and enhancements, and that's around credibility, how we determine credibility of an industry to kind of offset the fact that we do have uh, several small rate codes. So now we'll be getting into the industry impacts. Industry impacts provided in this presentation are comparing the final 2017 industry premium rate under the old method to what the 2017 rate would have been had we implemented the enhanced model. The intent of providing this information is to educate on how the model changes will impact various rate codes and provide a potential impact to employers. We did not implement the model in 2017 because there were very significant impacts on some rate codes and we needed the time to have sessions like this to share the impacts with, it, with individual rate codes. As well, we will be asking you for your input on how we transition to the new model in 2018. 2018 is likely not to be the same as what's happened in 2017 because we will have added on a year of experience and dropped off a year of experience when we calculate your costs. So these 20, the change that we're showing you here now could very well represent what will happen in 2018. It should be in the same trend, but it may not be exactly, because 
we aren't using the same data. So the first enhancement that I'll go through today is with respect to credibility. So credibility of industries is related to the classification recommendation. Because we have small rate codes that are less credible and less able to predict future cost, Eckler recommended changes <coughs> to our current credibility process in the current rate model. And there was kind of two aspects to that. Number one, he recommended that we change the way we calculate credibility, and he also recommended that when industries are less credible, that we use a different methodology to make them more predictable. And I'll get into both of those in a second here. So under the current model, we use five years of costs or five years of information to predict what's going to happen into the future um, for the various cost elements within the compensation system. And I'm just going to mention this because it does impact some of your rate codes later on. When we, we say we use a five-year cost, that's for all costs except medical. Under the old method, we only used to use three years of medical costs in that average to predict the future because we were experiencing um, above normal escalation in medical costs over the last few years. However, you know, recent experiences, that's starting to level off. So when I talk about the five-year average, I'm really saying five-year average for everything but medical. Uh, medical is at three years under the current model. So the current model calculates credibility using an industry's premiums. This method never attributed full credibility to any rate model and only 10 rate codes have greater than 75% credibility. What we do in the current model when a rate code is not credible is that we supplement that industry's experience with the average of the other 50 rate codes experience. So we're, we're supplementing your own experience with a portion of the board level experience to calculate how credible you are when we predict your future costs. I kind of got that wrong. So we, we calculate your credibility and to the extent that you aren't credibility credible, we use a portion of the board level experience to predict your future costs. Under the enhanced model, Eckler said we should look at an industry's own experience and if they don't have enough costs in that five years to make them credible, you should expand the, the length of time that you look at. So he, re he recommended two things. Number one, we move off of calculating credibility based on premiums to looking at the costs in the industry. And the second thing was, if you're not credible in that five-year period based on the formula, that you use your own experience for a longer period to att attain that credibility to determine that average cost that we're going to use to predict what your future costs are going to be. So perhaps it's easiest if I give an example. With the new model, if an industry over a five-year period has about $16.5 million in cost, they would be considered 100% credible. Because of that change, approximately 23 rate codes will be above 75% credibility, and there are several rate codes that can now stand on their own. They're 100% credible. So when we project that average, we're just using their costs and not mixing in the board level costs in the new method. So in this example, if you had an industry that had costs of approximately $10 million in a five-year period, they would be 60% credible. So when we go to calculate that average cost that we're going to use to predict the future, we would base 60%, because they're 60% credible under the formula, would be based on their five-year cost structure, and 40% of that 100% would be based on their 10-year average. So we supplement it with their own experience, and we're not mixing in board-level experience any longer with the new model. So what this does, it allows the model to use the industry's own experience to improve credibility, and that should improve accountability and 
predictability of what the rate will be for that rate code. And it's a balance, it reflects a balance of using your recent experience and reduces volatility for small rate codes. And the, I think one of the biggest benefits is it removes the reliance on that board level experience in the average for small rate codes. So rate codes that are negatively impacted by credibility would be seeing an increase because their experience is worse than the board level experience, which would decrease their costs under the current model, and or their 10-year average costs are higher than their five-year average costs, which increases their costs under the enhanced model. Rates that are positively impact, like government and, mi and ministries, on this slide, their experience would be better than the board average experience, which increases their costs under the current model, or their 10-year average costs are lower than their five-year claimed costs, which decreases their costs under the enhanced model. So for G51, currently it's calculated to be 82% credibility. So that's that old method of calculating credibility and the experience is worse than the overall board experience. So that would decrease your costs in the current <coughs> model. However, with the enhanced model, you're fully credible. So only five years of your costs would be used to predict the future. G51 though, um, and that kind of has like a negative or a fairly flat impact. So you're fully credible, you're using your own costs, it had kind of a negligible impact on the code. However, the change from the three to five years on medical costs, that averaging brought it down, and so that resulted in the decrease. So the three-year medical averaging in the old model uh, was a detriment to you. Because we're now including a five full year of costs, that has brought down the rate. So that element of the rate resulted in a one cent drop. For M31, this is the manufacturer, manufacturing and pipelines operations. There is a nine cent drop because of the change in credibility. So this occurs because under the current model, they were 25% credible, but their experience was better than the overall. So when you take away that board level experience, it's gonna bring their rate down for this element of the rate model. In the enhanced model, the new model, M31 is 40% credible, so we're gonna be relying on more of their 10-year costs. We're gonna use 60% of the five-year costs and 40% of the 10 year, sorry, 40% of the five year costs, 60% of the 10 year costs, but their 10 year costs would, were lower than their five year costs, so that also brought the model down. And the total impact of those two things was nine cents. For U11, the telecommunications, currently, this rate code is 30% credible, but their experience is better than the overall board experience, so that brought their costs in the new model down. They're 40% credible in the new model, but their 10-year costs were actually higher than their five-year costs, which brought, uh, which would have increased their costs in the new model. However, um, because their experience was so much better than the overall board experience, it nets out to a four cent decrease impact for that element. U31, electric systems. This, under the current model, this rate code is 46% credible. Their experience is worse, however, than the overall board experience, which decreases their costs in the current model. So the impact of this change will be an increase to um, credibility costs in the rate model for U31. In the new model, they're 52% credible, 
and their 10-year costs are lower than their five-year costs. So this part of the credibility calculation would actually decrease their costs, but not enough to offset the fact that their experience was worse than the overall board level experience under the old method. The next um, part of the rate model that Eckler reviewed and provided a recommendation on has to do with the use of indicators to predict rates. So the current model uses injury rates and time loss counts to predict future costs. This was true back in the 1990s when this current model was introduced. However, with the emergence of new trends, such as return to work, um, the medical cost increases, and the significant decline in time loss injury rates, we're seeing a dis, um, an, an, it used to be highly correlated with respect. If you had a time loss count, they were going up or down, your costs would follow. But now our costs are actually staying fairly steady, if not increasing. So there's no longer a correlation between the trend in the injury rates and costs. So the trend line for time loss injury rates may be going down, but our costs are, are actually going up per claim. So this was a problem. And Eckler recommended that we should use costs either determined on a five-year or a combination of five-year or ten years, depending on the credibility of the particular industry code, and apply the change in the number of people working or the change in the workforce to predict what future costs are. The change in the workforce is very strongly correlated to what our change in costs have been. So under the new model, or sorry, under the old model, we were actually under predicting, we were underestimating the cost per claim cost. The other thing that we used to do under the old model, because we knew we weren't calculating the right cost per claim by using that injury rate, which was falling very fast to predict future costs, is we used to intervene into the old model and average the current year's premium rate with the previous year's rate so that we would get a better estimation of what the cost per claim would be because we knew we were underestimating the cost per claim under the old model when we used injury rates to predict the future. So we blended two years of rates to ensure that the increasing costs of claims were covered by the premiums and also to reduce volatility of rates. So for example, in 2017, the, the, the rate that you would have been assessed at the industry level, at your rate code level, was a blend of what the, 27, the, model, the old model kicked out for 2017 and 2016. Eckler recommended that we discontinue this practice and that we move to costs adjusted for the workforce to estimate what the future increase in costs would be. So we'll now go through the impacts of this change with respect to change of indicators on the various codes. So for G51, there's a net decrease of four cents. Removing or not using time loss counts to predict the future trend in future costs resulted for G51 in an increase of four cents on the rate. So removing that, using that trend of the decreasing um, injury rate to predict the future cost per claim added four cents to the rate. However, this was offset by a seven cent reduction, or sorry, that was an increase of three cents. My mouth's a little bit out here. Um, and the removal of the blending dropped the rate by seven cents for a net of a four cent drop. For M31, pipeline manufacturing and operations, using the workforce metric will cause the rate model to expect an increase in claims future cost liabilities that is in line with the growth in the industry. 
the adoption of the workforce as a metric caused an increase of 11 cents. However, this was offset by a six cent reduction due to the fact that we were no longer blending two years of rates. So it's kind of the opposite um, that had happened in G31, and that is because the workforce was growing in M31. Telecommunications, where we'll see a slight increase of one cent, and this is, this is a net out of a four cent increase due to using the workforce. So the costs are fairly stable, but workforce indicators would say that there is growth, so that is going up by four cents. And removing the blending of the two years of rates dropped it by three cents for a net one cent increase. For U31 electric systems, the net impact is a 10 cent drop. So using the workforce caused the rate model to expect an increase in claim costs that is in line with the steady state of the industry. However, time loss counts had been increasing more quickly than the workforce in this industry. Therefore, the adoption of the workforce actually caused a, a, a decrease in that element of the model and removing the blending of the two years added another seven cents for a total drop of 10 cents. Costly claim pooling is the next recommendation that Eckler provided to the board with respect to our rate making model. Costly claim pooling is when costs are spread amongst a larger group of employers. For example, Certain costs may be allocated at the rate code level or amongst all employers. This increases collective liability so that a group of employers is not unfairly burdened with excessive costs of claims. Excessive costs go into that larger pool to be shared by all employers in the system. The current model only pools costs for pension costs exceeding a set $90,000 limit at the class level. So I'm going to step back here a bit. So the class, we have kind of three levels of accountability or pooling at the board. So there's the overall board where all employers share in costs. Then there was the class level. So each industry belongs to a class. And they're, under the old model, we shared costs at that class level. And then there's the accountability at the individual employer level, which is um, reflected through the experience rating program. In the old model, we only picked one cost, and that was pension cost for long-term claims. And we looked at that cost. When it exceeded $90,000, it got shared just amongst the other rate codes in a particular class. So for example, in the G code, there are five codes. So pension costs above $90,000 were shared amongst the five rate codes in the G classification. Eckler said that that's not very good collective liability, or he didn't feel that it was actually fair the way we were doing it, and suggested that we need to increase collective liability at the board level so that rare costly claims do not burden an industry. The other thing that he recommended is that looking only at pension costs was not a good thing to do, that we should look at all costs related to a claim. So that would include all compensation costs, medical costs, voc, re costs, voc rehab costs, etc. He also said you shouldn't have a fixed um, cap, so to speak, in there, because it becomes irrelevant over time, you know, economic factors change, you, you know, whatever you pick should move with changes in the economy. So he had recommended that we tie it to the maximum in insurable earnings, and the board decided after some analysis that three times the current maximum insurable earnings should be the cap per claim for costs. So up to that three times the maximum insurable limit, which is around 251, 252,000 costs 
would be borne by the rate code. Above that, they get put into a pool that would get shared amongst all industries based on their relative uh, proportion of cost to board level costs. And this cap is indexed because it's going to follow the change in the insurable earnings, which is also has an indexing provision. So using the three times max means that about 40 or 50 rate codes will benefit from costly claim pooling. I'll be talking about fatalities in a minute, but they're also uh, subject to this capping on a per claim cost basis. So moving to Eckler's recommendation improves collective liability above the cap. So if you have costs above the cap, it's an unusually expensive claim. Those costs are being shared by all rates, all rate codes. It improves predictability and stability of rates, but it also, probably more importantly, improves the accountability for claims costs up to that cap amount for the industries where they are occurring. So for uh, G51, government and ministries, the result of the change to the capping, moving away from just pension costs to all costs, has resulted in a four cent increase. So the average pension costs in G51 were higher than the average sector G pension costs. So G51 used to benefit from the old way of just looking at pension costs. And costs in excess of three times the maximum are lower than the board average. Therefore, that part of it will increase their rates as well. So they don't have as many costs over the 252, and they had more proportionate pension costs over the average for the G class. So they're being impacted from both sides on the change to that element. For M31, pipeline operations, there's a decrease of five cents. So again, both elements are, are impacting this. Their average pension costs were lower than the sector M pension costs. So the pension pooling used to actually increase M31's rate. Costs in excess of three times max are less than the board average. Therefore, pooling costs will increase their rate. So they have more costs that fall before below that $252,000 or $251,000 limit. So more of it will be borne by their rate, cord, rate code. However, because they assumed a larger portion of those pension costs, the net amount is a five cent drop. U11 or tele telecommunications is seeing a one cent increase. So their average pension costs were higher than the average sector U costs, and use, they used to benefit from the old pooling method. Their costs in excess of three times max are lower than the board average, therefore they're picking up more of their own costs, and that nets out to a one cent increase for that element. Electric systems are seeing a one cent decrease. So their average pension costs were lower than the average sector U pension costs, and pension pooling used to increase their rate. However, their costs in excess of three times max are higher than the board average. Therefore, pooling costs will decrease their rate, and the net amount is the one cent drop. So Eckler also looked at the way we treat fatalities. So currently, every rate code pays the same uh, amount. So in 2017, that was four cents for fatalities. And that is based on a 10-year average cost of all fatalities in the system. So you're charged that same four cents in your rate code, whether you had a fatality or not. Eckler said, recommended that we need to increase accountability with respect to fatality costs, 
and that the industry should be charged for the cost of fatalities that are occurring in their workplaces. The board decided that fatality claims should be treated as the same as any other claim. So all costs related to a fatality should be charged to the employer and the rate code or the risk pool um, where they originated. So while extremely tragic, fatalities are, are really no, or sorry, fatalities are really no different than severe claims. And this is seen as a move to pr promote additional accountability and promote additional prevention behavior. <coughs> so the recommendation um, that will be implemented in 2018 is that the costs related to fatalities will be charged to the industry in which they occur, but they will be subject to the cost of claim pooling cap of that 252000 So fatalities can range uh, in costs from, from very minimal amounts to, to cover just burial costs to well over a million and a half dollars should someone die and have dependents and a dependent spouse. But for those very expensive claims, they will be capped at 252000 and any amounts over that will go into um, the board pool and get allocated back to all industries based on their share of costs. So that promotes or, or helps with the collective liability that all employers share in the cost of the system and help with unusually large claims. You know, if you go back to the house example, if my house burns down, um, I don't have to pay four hundred thousand dollars or five hundred or three hundred to rebuild it. Insurance helps me to do that. My next year's premium rate might have a bit of a surcharge on it, but I'm not going to be charged for the cost. The other people in my risk pool have helped assume the cost of my house being rebuilt, and it's the same concept with how we're treating fatalities. Up to a certain amount, you are responsible. After that, it will get shared at the board level risk pool. So the outcome of this is that industries should be more accountable up to that 252 cap amount and we still provide for collective liability for costly claims so that we share those costs for unusually high costly claims. So the impact on the individual rate codes is um, for G51 as a result of this change, there's a one set drop. So the, this rate code is 100% credible. So their five year costs were lower than the 10 year average four cents. So they're dropping by a penny with respect to the cost of fatalities in G51. M31 is also seeing a drop. M31, if you recall, is not fully credible. They're about 40% credible, so their five and 10 year costs related to fatalities are less than the 10 year average of four cents, so they're gonna be dropping by a penny on this part of the code, or the rate. U11 is also dropping by four cents. U11 is not fully credible, so their five and 10 year average costs were less than the 10 year average of four cents, so they're also dropping by four cents. By the way, um, U11 had zero fatalities in, in that five year averaging period in the years 2011 to 2015. U31 is seeing a slight increase of one cent due to fatalities because their costs in that averaging period, the period that we used to predict future costs were actually higher than the 10 year average. And there were eight fatalities in the years 2011 to 2015 in U31. The next element of the model that Eckler made recommendations on has to do with long-term claims. Currently, all costs, regardless of when they occur, are included in 
determining that five or 10 year average that we use to predict the future year's costs. So that means if there's an injury that happened 50 years ago in that rate code and it still has costs, it would be included when we try to figure out what next year's <coughs> costs are gonna be. Eckler said that's not a very good practice. It's not reactive enough. And you need to increase accountability based on what's happening more recently rather than what happened 50 years ago. So he recommended that we cut off claims past a certain age when we're calculating that average, whether it be on a five or a combined five and 10 year basis to predict the future costs. He recommended um, five to 10 years, but we did some analysis at the board and based on, we thought seven years was a good cutoff for an age of a claim to be included in that average because at seven years, an industry has experienced on average 75% of the cost of that claim. So the board approved that we no longer look at really old claims when we look at a rate code's experience to calculate what's gonna go ahead for the following year. So what happens to those costs that are older than seven years old? They end up going into a board level pool that again will be allocated based on costs. So it improves the collective liability for really old stuff that is currently included when we calculate a rate codes rate. This improves equity of the process because those claims that happened many, many years ago may have happened in industries that no longer exist or previous employers under different technology. We've got different uh, prevention practices now, so they're not really relevant to predicting what's going to happen in the future. So removing the really old claims has improved the system by making it more fair, you're more accountable for your recent experience, and also provided some collective liability because we do have to still cover those costs for those really old claims. So in summary, if the costs that are greater than seven years, if the, if the costs are greater than seven years, they're not gonna go into that average based on either five or 10 year costs to predict next year's costs. If the costs are greater than seven years old, they will go into a pool to be allocated amongst all rate codes based on their proportionate cost structure. This will increase reactivity and accountability and put an emphasis on more recent experience for rate codes. So the impact of this, on G51, there's an eight cent increase G51 has a smaller proportion of costs in that long-term tail. So more of their costs are current, they're in that seven years, so pooling of the costs uh, increases their cost by eight cents. M31, operations of pipelines, has a smaller portion of costs in the long-term claim than average. So moving to this cutoff of the claims actually will increase their rate by two cents. Likewise, telecommunications has a smaller portion of costs in that long-term average. So pooling the costs increases their costs by one cent. Electric systems, they're going the other way. They have a decrease of seven cents. U31 has a larger proportion of costs in the long term than average. So pooling those costs, they've got more costs that are more than seven years old, will actually decrease their costs by seven cents for this element of the model. So the um, last, I think, yeah, this is the last one. The last element that Eckler looked at was how we allocate the administration costs, and the administration costs are those of running the WCB board. Right now, we, um, we do allocate our administrative costs based on variable and fixed components, 
But Eckler, when he looked at our cost structure and kind of reviewed what was going on in other boards, he says, I think something is out of whack here. And he suggested that we go back and analyze our actual cost structure to see truly how many of our costs are fixed and how many are variable. So a fixed cost would be costs that the board incurs whether a claim happens or not. So that's the stuff, you know, your utilities, your rent, um, IT infrastructure, um, cost of some of the governance and executive salaries. Whereas variable costs relate to the costs we incur because we need to process claims because they're associated with the processing and the management of claims in the system. So when we went back and looked at our, our budget structure, we determined that our fixed component was actually closer to, or it was 30%, not 10%, and that our variable portion was 70%. So the board approved um, a change to allocate those fixed and variable proportions based on that 70-30 split. Another thing um, that I need to, to say here is that premiums, we use premiums to determine the allocation of fixed costs. So those are costs that are going to be incurred whether there's claims or not. And we use relative uh, premium assessments to determine how much each rate code should pay for the fixed component. And variable costs are allocated out based on claims cost. So the, this recommendation has resulted in an increase of the fixed component assessed to rate codes based on their relative proportion of the premiums overall and reducing the component based on cost to 70%. So as a result, um, and just kind of in general, if you're a high payroll rate code with relatively low costs, you're going to be seeing an increase in your admin component because the fixed component has gone up. So for G51, um, they're seeing a slight decrease in the administrative cost of one cent, and that is due mostly to um, less variable costs being assumed by G51. M31, however, is seeing a six cent increase. Their um, premiums are relatively low, implying that they have low cost structure. So therefore, the fixed component had went up more than the drop in the variable component <coughs> by reducing the variable component from 90 to 70%. So the, the result for M31 was a net increase of six cents. U31, telecommunications, again, is being impacted. They're a, they're a low, relatively low um, premium rate code, implying that they have low costs. So therefore, their fixed component assessment increased the admin component by four cents. U31, um, the change from 90 to 70 percent for variable and the change from 10 to 30 percent fixed, those changes offset each other and there is no impact with respect to admin costs. So the rate code, as you can see on these slides, Oops, didn't want to go that far. The rate code is a dynamic system with many integrated moving parts. And the numbers and changes to the elements we are showing you here today help to explain, will help to explain why a rate code is moving in the direction it is. These elements all work together, and it's not possible to change one without having an impact on the system as a whole. So now we'll get into um, the actual results comparing 2017 old to the 2017 enhanced model. So for G51, there's a 3.1% increase, which is four cents. 
The total premium impact for G51 is approximately $385,000. So there is an impact, an increased one-time transition cost to move of approximately $385,000. Moving ahead, the impact of the change in the model will be totally dependent on the experience in G51. So had we implemented in 2017, the premiums that we would have raised from G51 would have been $385,000 more than what the old model kicked out. For M31, there's a one cent decrease, which equates to a 2.2% decrease. In total, this had an impact of approximately a negative $24,000 in premiums, so $24,000 less premiums would have been collected. Again, this is a one-time transition benefit, and moving ahead, the experience in M31 will dictate what their rate change will be. In U31 telecommunications, there is a one cent drop, which equates to 2.3%. And that totaled approximately $28,000 for a one-time reduction in the premiums. And again, future experience will dictate what those rate changes will be. U31 electric systems um, is seeing a 15 cents or 20% decrease in their rate code which equates to approximately 454,000 had we implemented in 2017. Again, this is a one-time transition amount and moving ahead, the experience will dictate the rate changes. And I do have to say again, we are just showing you this as a proxy for what could happen in 2018. The actual results for 2018 will likely differ from what these impacts are. So what are our next steps? So today's presentation is recorded and would be available for you to listen to again if you can stand to listen to me for another hour and a bit. <laughs> and um, the website, oops, sorry. Oop, this is different than mine. So the website uh, is noted on, um, on the page there where you can find the webinar. If you have more questions, please email us at askwcb.com. Um, there may be questions that, that you have today and you can think of right now. We'll entertain them in a few minutes here. But if there's things you think of later after you've gone back and, and had a chance to, to digest all this information or perhaps look at some of the other information we have online, and we'd be happy to answer those questions. So if you funnel them through Ask WCB, we will return your uh, questions with an answer. And most importantly, we're asking for transition feedback with respect to how we move to this new model. We will be implementing the new model in 2018, but there are some significant impacts on some industries. So we're asking for input with respect to how we could best transition. We could do it all in 2018, just bite the bullet and, and incur those one-time costs for those that are going up or uh, have the benefit of the one-time decreases. We could spread out the impact over a couple of years. There are other options. There, maybe there's other options available out there. So we do have a form online asking for your input to either say, yeah, do it in one year, do it over two years, or here's another method you might consider for implementing. The board will take all of that feedback when it decides how to transition to this model. So we still need to collect the same amount of revenue. And if we defer the transition of the benefit for rate codes that are going down or would appear to be going down, down under the new model, we also have to uh, defer, sorry, if rate codes are going up and we defer that cost or try to smooth it, it's also gonna smooth the decreases for rate codes that will be going down because we still have to collect the same amount of revenue. 
The feedback uh, form will be open until April 7th, and we do ask that all feedback be provided through that mechanism. Oh, there's the, uh, the websites on the last page. So in closing, I would just like to reinforce the importance of injury prevention and the fact that the least expensive injury is the injury that never happens and that we are well on our way to achieving mission zero. That's zero injuries, zero fatalities, zero suffering. In fact, in 2016, 88 percent of our employers were injury free and we'd like to thank you for your efforts with respect to Mission Zero and for attending today. So I'll open it up for questions now and if you could please use the mic and we have some people uh, gathering any questions that might come from the online webinars. Ah, Alex has a question. This is from one of the webinar viewers. Uh, when it's all said and done, will the net be more or less money coming into WCB to offset actual costs? When it is all, s sorry? No. Oh, sorry, you made a face there, so I thought. Okay, uh, so when it's all said and done, we're still gonna be collecting the same amount of revenue under the old model versus the new model. However, at individual rate codes, there could be different impacts. So some are going up, some are going down. When I said earlier in the presentation, when we calculated the board average rate under the new method, it was the same as the $1.24 that we calculated under the old method. So we're, we need the same amount of revenue. It's just how we determine each rate code's uh, relative portion of that that has changed. So there is a lot of information here and if you don't have your questions right now, please do email them in and we will return them to you. Um, are there any more questions? So thank you very much for coming, and I see there's still lunch back there if anybody needs to grab lunch before they go back to work. Thank you.